Jesus' opening words in the Gospel of Mark are, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus' public ministry opens almost exactly the same in Matthew's Gospel. And the emphasis on the kingdom of God appears in chapter 4 of Luke's Gospel before he even calls the disciples. Luke summarizes Jesus' ministry with almost the same language in chapter 8 of his gospel, where it says that Jesus went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus tells us, but seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And we pray every week, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So we can hardly overstate the centrality of the kingdom of God in the teaching of Jesus And that may surprise us because so much of modern Christianity, particularly in the West, focuses on either personal improvement or morality or getting one's ticket punched for heaven when they die. But all of this falls underneath the overarching teaching about the kingdom of God. In Jesus, something entirely new, something truly revolutionary has come. In his book, Simply Good News, N.T. Wright says, Jesus wasn't like someone offering people a new type of torch so they could see better in the dark. He was like someone saying the sun had risen and that if you would only open the curtains, you'd see you don't need a torch anymore. Jesus' focus is the kingdom of God. Everything else he says and does is helping us to understand and see how the kingdom has come, how that kingdom will come to fruition. When you and I adopt Jesus' focus as our own, when we take up a kingdom mindset, when we root ourselves in the reality of this kingdom focus, we not only have hope for the future, we have hope here and now. So, here's a question for you. When does eternal life begin? So often, people will say, well, when you die, you enter eternal life. But that's not true. Your eternal life begins when you are baptized. Your eternal life begins with your baptism. And the moment we are washed with those saving waters, our citizenship is transferred into the kingdom of God. In the prayer over the water, the priest says, Sanctify this water by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those here who are cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ. Not that when they die, they'll go to heaven. No, that they'll continue forever. They're already moved into this kingdom. So our eternal connection with God, our eternal life as citizens of the kingdom begins with the water of baptism, not with our death. We do not wait here on earth as if we are in some divine waiting room, some sort of DMV line for heaven. We already are there. We already have this union with God. Jesus proclaimed that in his coming, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. And this kingdom is radically different from the kingdoms and powers of the world. In fact, Jesus' teaching almost always highlights some way the kingdom of God is different. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Pray for your enemies. Give to those who ask. Turn the other cheek. Walk the extra mile. It all comes to a head in the radical nature of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, which was not a blistering defeat, but was the consummate victory for the kingdom of God. The good news that Jesus proclaimed and demonstrated was trying to get us to see the kingdom has come even though we wait for its final form. So we live in the here and now, and we pray daily for its ultimate revealing at the end of all things. So in Jesus' teaching, he's showing us what a kingdom people look like, how the people of the kingdom are called to live. According to Jesus, the kingdom of God should be the predominant way we view the world. Jesus' proclamation reminds us of what is truly important. It manages our opinions and outlook, helps us form our lives, 
forms our values and opinions and our behavior. We are people of the kingdom. Unfortunately, today, even among Christians, there are many other things that we allow to form us. We sometimes allow pain and tragedy to form our worldview. We sometimes allow political ideology to dominate our worldview. Competing philosophies, humanism, materialism, consumerism, fatalism to form our worldviews. But our calling as Christians is to allow Jesus' notion of the kingdom to be the lens through which we live our lives. And I believe as we do this, not only will our lives become more authentically Christ-like, but our families, our churches, our communities will be transformed. When our faith and our living intersect into a visible, kingdom-oriented life, we find peace and purpose. We discover the Westminster, Westminster Confession's proclamation is true, that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. In many of Jesus' parables, he begins by saying the kingdom of God is like, like a net thrown into a sea, like a treasure hidden in a field, like a merchant in search of fine pearls. In today's lesson, Jesus says it's like a man who scattered seed on the ground, and it's like a grain of mustard seed. In the first parable, Jesus says, it says the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. In this parable, Jesus is reminding us that there's a mystery regarding the growth of the kingdom and the work of grace in our lives. There's a sense of mundane duty here. There's nothing exciting or noteworthy or flashy about what the sower is doing. It's simply what the farmer is called to do, and he does it. Our discipleship as individuals and as a church community is rooted in the basic repetition of our responsibilities before God. Like the farmer, it's based on a rhythm, a rhythm of action. It's doing what we are called to do day in and day out, being faithful in small yet important actions. It's being faithful in our worship, our prayer, our study, our giving, our service, and our witness. It's loving our families, our children, our parents, our neighbors, our fellow parishioners. And the reality is that it is a stubborn steadfastness to keeping the kingdom always before us. And the reality is also that as this parable suggests, that as we do these things, the kingdom will grow. We may not see it immediately, just like the farmer may not see the results immediately in his crop. But it may, and it may grow quite imperceptibly in us, but it will grow nonetheless. It is through the steady rhythm of having the seeds of the kingdom sown into our lives and in the lives of our families and churches that the kingdom multiplies. And it's not instant. It's not instant. We love instant. Click, click. Let's get there. Let's get it done. Let's buy it. Let's get it. Jesus calls us to patience. And the second parable is the famous analogy of the mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. While the first parable spoke of the surprising growth of the kingdom through the faithful sowing of the farmer, this parable speaks to the reach and health of the kingdom from meager beginnings. It's a parable discussing the power of faith, even a small amount. 
The parable is showing us that the kingdom of God, while it may start small, can have great effects. It's not so much about the mustard seed itself, but what happens to it. Its focus is on the destiny of the seed in the kingdom. And the kingdom's movement in a person's life may start so small, almost imperceptibly. It may start with just attending one service at church. It may start with randomly flipping through a Bible. It may start with an encouraging word of a friend. But over time, it grows. It takes root. And over a lifetime, it matures. It has an effect. It has an effect in the kingdom of the person's life, and it has an effect on the lives of others. In our modern day, we tend to think bigger and faster is better. We want bigger. We want faster. We've seen this played out in the modern phenomenon of the, meta, of the mega church. But did you know the kingdom has a greater reach in the small local church? 59% of churches in the U.S. have less than 100 attendees. Churches under 500 are 35% of the churches. So 93% of American churches have under 500 in attendance. 93% of American churches are not mega churches. They are mustard seed kingdom outposts. We should strive for growth, yes, because that is our calling. We are called to expand the kingdom. We are called to recognize that each person, each member, is a valued part of the body of Christ and a soul in need. We do not allow ourselves to be enamored with building our kingdom. We are called to build his kingdom. I believe we need to recover this crucial and central tenet of Jesus' teaching in the New Testament and see its importance in our life of discipleship. God gives the growth, sometimes without us even realizing it. But the key is the habitual and faithful work of the sower. We may aim to sow the seed, we aim to sow the seeds of the kingdom in our, to our lives and the lives of others and see how God will grow us all. And we don't despair at small starts, at simple beginnings or faltering steps. The story of Christianity is full of examples of how the kingdom grows and spreads from small starts, small seeds, and faltering steps. Amen.